Hey everyone, so welcome back.、Um, we're gonna start our session three, machine learning and society. So first, let's welcome Simona Alves from Colombia to give us、uh, a presentation about her paper, "The Changing Economics and Knowledge Production." Okay. Thank you so much for having me today. So today I'm going to present a paper, which is joint work with my colleague Laura Valkamp. So let me jump straight into the motivation for this paper. So in this paper we have a relatively simple question: Are big data technologies the industrialization of knowledge production? What do I mean by that? Well, let me start with an example. Imagine that we are before the industrial revolution, and you have a blacksmith that has some capital, buys some tools, and produces some goods that then sells. Now, imagine that I was to give a lot more capital to this blacksmith. Well, potentially, it could scale up production a bit, could hire an apprentice, but it couldn't make so much use of all that extra capital, and so the marginal value of all that extra capital would not be so high. At least not as high as relatively after the industrial revolution. Now we have the factory that's producing the same goods. Now imagine that I give all that extra capital to the factory owner. Well, because there is this new technology, it could potentially scale up production and make more efficient use of that capital. And so what happens is that the marginal value of capital goes up after that technology takes place, and that was a pretty revolutionary change. What we're asking is: Are AI technology doing something similar, but not for the production of physical goods, but for the production of knowledge? Again, an example. Imagine I have an investment manager who's、um, endowed with the quote-unquote old technology. Let's call it regression for simplicity, and he has a data set. With a hundred variables, a million observations, and he's running regression analysis, or you know whatever your preferred technology is,、um, to generate some trading signals. So to generate knowledge from that data. Now imagine that I was to give this investment manager a data set with a million variables and ten million observations. Well, clearly you cannot plug the million variables into a regression. Of course, it can do a bit more than what it could do with the initial data set, but the marginal value of all that extra data would not be as high, or at least relatively would not be as high as if now my investment manager is endowed with these big data technologies. I'm not going to take a stance here on terminology. We're going to use a shorthand AI for the rest of the project, but just think about data analysis technologies that allow scaling up、uh, the derivation of insights from larger data sets. Well, if now I was to give that data set with one million variables and ten million observations to the AI endowed investment manager, it definitely can do more with that, and so the marginal value of that additional data would be higher. You start to see the parallel. Now, why is it important to determine if this is as revolutionary, or to at least compare how revolutionary is this technological change relatively to what happened in the past? Well, because it can impact a lot of stuff that we care about. It matters for labor income shares. It matters for competition. It matters for firm size. And these are things that we care a lot to understand in finance. So what we're going to be doing here, we're trying, we're going to really try to quantify how important is that change, particularly from the perspective of does it change the marginal value of the inputs of production. Which in this case are going to be data and labor rather than capital and labor in the way that we are used to think about it, say for industrial revolution. Now, what's the challenge? These technologies have not been around for so long. Well, AI, machine learning, neural nets—we know that have been around for a long time. But only after deep learning is that we can really actually leverage these technologies、uh, in the way that we are thinking about them today. And that's when potentially they have been having that revolutionary,、uh, quote unquote, impact. And so it's a short time, and also we want to have a fairly clean framework to think about a knowledge industry because in a non-knowledge industry, other things might be happening. And for those reasons, we decide to focus on the financial industry and particularly on the investment management industry because it's a clearly a knowledge industry, and so a lot of these things will map more clearly. And you'll see what I mean in a second.、Um, And also is an early adopter of new technologies, particularly information technologies. And so it's the right setting for us to start and make that point, which we think though could potentially have a broader implications. So in one slide, let me actually show you the way that we are thinking about this. You want to produce knowledge. 
Let's keep on the parallel with our investment manager. You want to generate trading signals, okay? So what do you need to do? You need to gather data. Let's say we have raw and structured data out there, but you can also think about structured data sets that I can acquire. But once I acquire all these data, those that do empirical analysis among us, they know that whenever I acquire a data set, even if it's sold in whatever kind of structured manner, it still needs a lot of work to get it in a state that is useful for my purposes. We are gonna use job postings data in here. It's technically a structured data set. It took me nine months before I could run my first estimation. And so there is a lot of work that just goes into gathering, structuring data and getting that asset ready for it to be utilized. We call that processing and think about cleaning, structuring, warehousing data is gonna require labor, which we're gonna call data managers. Think about cybersecurity, warehouse uh, engineers, software engineers, all those people that ensure that the firm can have that asset and utilize it properly. Once you have this asset, that's when you can analyze it. Whatever I'm gonna call data in this paper is going, you have to think structure data. I need to analyze it, and here is where we're gonna think about these different technologies. I can analyze it with quote unquote our regression technology, and I can analyze it with quote unquote the AI technology. Does the fact that I use one or the other have an impact? And if it does, how much so? And that's what we're gonna be trying to quantify in here. Now it's very important to point out that this is a bit of a like chicken and egg problem, right? If I have a lot of data, I'm gonna have an incentive to invest in technologies that allow me to process more data. If I am very good in having these technologies that allow me to process a lot of data, I have more of an incentive to collect more of it. And that is why in this paper, we're gonna have a structural approach because it's going to be impossible to disentangle any causality between these two things. We really think that they're gonna act jointly. So what I'm gonna do here, we're gonna have a model, and if you understood this flow, the model then follows very simply because we're just basically gonna put some equations into this concept. And then we're gonna use information from the investment management industry, in, particularly, in particular job postings information, to quantify the demand of labor of these firms of these three types of workers. Your data managers and your analysts skilled with the old and new technology. Then we're gonna lever the structure of the model to utilize those quantities and measure what impact these technological changes had on the marginal value of analyzing larger data sets, on the productivity of this knowledge production. So that's where we're going with this. Um, some preliminary results, what we find is that AI, and I think AI is big data technologies, have been having um, quite a big impact on this productivity of knowledge production and these numbers, of course, are restric restricted to the, where we test it, which is investment management. But you can think about using the same methodology in other settings as well. So what we find is that labor income share fell from 18% to 13%. This change is actually quite sizable if we want to compare it to similar changes um, during the Industrial Revolution, where the estimates here, we find a 5% change. There is a range of estimates between 5 and 20% for that period. Um, how does that happen? Are machines substituting our jobs? Well, when we look at the data, we do see this big productivity change, but we don't see a decrease in the demand for labor of actually any of the three types of labor. And so the way we interpret this is that, yes, the labor income share of labor drops, so the owner of the data gets a bigger share of the pie, but a bigger share of a bigger pie. And so we don't actually observe drops in um, demand for labor. So with that in mind, a couple words about where we place in the literature. Well, we do contribute to the literature on estimating the value of intangibles because you'll see that at a side product of whatever we do, we're gonna have a methodology to estimate the value of the data of these firms. We also contribute to the vast literature of information in financial markets, and this is by no means exhaustive. The point that I wanna make here is that usually in most of these papers, and other papers that Laura and I have written in the past do exactly the same. You equate data to signal to knowledge. It's all the same, it's packaged into one element and then we see what happens after. What we're doing is that we're ignoring what happens after and we're unpacking this pre-step and we're splitting data from information from knowledge. And so that's the way that you wanna think about this. 
And of course, because we use the labor market, we're going to also have something to say about how AI impacts the labor market, particularly in the investment management industry. So let me go straight to a few equations. And there are not going to be many, just two slides of them. So what is here? This is the second box of the flow chart I showed you earlier. This is the analyst, the technology. Here are simple Cobb Douglas technologies. This is the knowledge produced by firm I at time T. Knowledge, think trading signal. Here is scale to however much precision of signals generate $1 worth of knowledge. It's not going to matter so much because you'll see that we don't actually need to measure that. The knowledge that a firm I produces at time T is a function of what? Cobb Douglas, two inputs, data, and labor. There are also two other parameters here. They're kind of total factor productivities. If you want to think about it from the perspective of a regression, we're just trying to absorb time and firm fixed effects. So we're trying to absorb whatever is specific to either a time period or the specific firm to really focus on what we're interested in. What is that? Well, what's the key difference that we're interested in between the AI and all tech technology is the difference in productivity, the difference in the mix of the inputs, data and labor. In a Cobb Douglas setting, that's regulated by this parameter right here. We come to this agnostically. Maybe we find that they're not statistically different from each other. But if we find that there is a big difference between those two, that big difference, how it can be interpreted, is that there is a big difference in the productivity, difference in the labor income shares, and so on. And so that's what we're trying to measure. Couple more things about this. Data is the same data. So for my time t, they can have some AI analysts. They can have some classic quantitative researchers. It's fine, but the data set of the firm is the same. It's not that some teams of JP Morgan can access the data and some others cannot. And data is non-rival. So all the workers of a firm at a given point in time can draw from the same database. What is different here is labor. When you have this capital L, when you have this small L, what's the difference? The skill set. So we really want to try and measure how many analysts have the AI skill set within the firm and how many analysts do not have it. And from here onwards, big data technologies, I'm always going to use the shorthand AI. And regression and so on, I'm going to call it old tech. So I'm just going to stick to that terminology until the end of the talk. That's the second box. What happens to the first box? You remember the data structuring. Well, what is the stock of data of firm I at time t plus 1 is going to be the stock of data they had at time t depreciated by some parameter delta, depreciation rate of the data, plus however much more data our data managers are capable of adding to the data set at time t. These data managers also have some decreasing returns to scale, and firms need to hire the data managers to maintain and increase the size of their data stock. So what happens? Well, the value of the data of the firm is determined by however much knowledge they produce with the two technologies. The firm can choose to have just one, the other, a mix of the two, minus however much they pay in salaries to the three types of workers, plus some Gordon growth term of the present value of the future value of my data stock. From here, we can derive three conditions. We take a first order condition with respect to the three types of workers. These are going to be the choice variables of my firms. How many workers of each type do I have in a given point in time? These three equations, I'm going to allow me to pin down these three parameters right here, which are the parameters that, that regulate the decreasing returns to scale of the three types of labor. What I'm really interested in is the difference between these two. Now, these three equations are not sufficient. There is one more thing I need to know. To get the data stock of all these firms, because I just showed you kind of a recursive formulation, t plus 1 relative to t, to d pl t plus 1 relative to dt, I need to know a starting condition, a d0 for every firm. Otherwise, this recursive formulation is not quite going to work. And those are things that I need to pin down. It's another parameter. Now, in theory, I could pin down a D0 for every single firm in my sample. That's going to be computationally infeasible, so given the data size. 
But what I can do, I can compute the D0 average, so kind of the average size of the data stock of these firms at the beginning of my estimation period. And then I can map that with some proportionality parameter across all the other firm, all the firms in my sample. And how I'm gonna do that proportionality, I'm gonna use the data from 2000 to 2014 as a burn-in period. And then I'm gonna use a proportionality based on those first four years, um, computed based on those first four years in my estimation going forward. So I need to estimate four parameters, the three that I've just showed you, plus this D0 average that then I'm gonna need to map everything else. There is something else that I need to compute, which are the fixed effects. How do we compute it? Well, I'm going to have four equations per month per firm. Of course, it's much more than what I need for the four parameters. But I'm gonna compute these fixed effects, exactly how we compute fixed effects in a linear regression. It's gonna be either the time series average of a given firm, or it's gonna be the cross-sectional average of the conditions across the cross-sectional firms in a given point in time. So I'm kind of demeaning um, to control for those either time or firm specific effects. Okay, so measurement. This is the model. Um, what I need is to have these four conditions per firm per month, and then I can lever the structure of the model to estimate these parameters. What do I need? Well, I need to know how many workers each firm of interest has a stock of at a given point in time, and I need to know how much money they are paying them, okay? That sounds uh, like something is, that these firms do not directly disclose. So where we go, we go to their demand for labor first. Let me be precise, this is job postings and it's demand for labor. We're gonna do a bit to transform this demand into stock. But let me explain how we estimate the demand for labor first. We acquired the burning glass technology data sets that contains job postings for the majority of US firms um, between 2010 and 2018. Based on that, we identify the jobs of these investment management firms. And then within those jobs, we identify the jobs that we call AI or tech or data management. How do we do that? In a very low tech way. <laughs> because here we need to map precisely to some economic concept in the model, we need to really do a very precise categorization of what are the skills that map to the conceptual thing that we have in the model. And so we use a dictionary-based approach where we build dictionaries of the skills that we think are predominantly AI, old tech, or data management. And then we actually utilize the entire text of each job postings, not the structured data of burning class, just a full text, to actually assess how frequently these skills are mentioned in each job posting. These are work clouds, and what I want to be specific about is that each of these work clouds is for the jobs that are exposed to be classified as AI or tech and data management, but each cloud contains all the keywords. So I'm saying within the AI jobs, how frequently are any of the keywords mentioned? And you see that there is a very clear predominance of AI-related keywords within those jobs. Yes, that's how we structured it to be, but if you might think that, let's say, data managers are not a thing in these firms and they're just AI jobs with some data management skills, that's not what emerges in here because AI is not by far one of the frequent words mentioned in those jobs. There seems to be a clear distinction between these types of jobs. Now, um, innovations in here. We focus on a specific industry, investment management. It's important here because it gives us the opportunity to really zone in in some very specific types of jobs and skills. And um, we categorize the jobs based on the full text, which is also very important because let's say if I mention AI in a posting, some AI knowledge is a plus. If I just use a structured data set, that's gonna be classified as an AI job. And that's what most of the papers using this data do. In our case, it's not. And it's important that there is this relative frequency because we don't want to misclassify a lot of the jobs in here. Now, so far, these are just some examples. This is like a quant analyst from Two Sigma. Uh, strong knowledge of computational numerical algorithms, linear algebra, statistical methods, experience for working with large data sets. An example of an AI analyst looking for talented researchers who can apply and develop machine learning algorithms for financial data sets and so on. An example of a Two Sigma data manager, um, software engineer, 
data, SQL data analyst, um, capturing and processing massive amounts of data for thousands of different tradable securities, enabling our big data analysis. So, so far I told you how we measure the demand for labor, but those elements in our model are the stock of labor. So not the flow, how much do I demand in a given point in time, but how many workers do I have today with those skills. To go from demand to stock, we utilize information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on separation states and uh, postings to hiring rates. So if you think about, let's give one example, the amount of AI workers of firm I at time T is the amount of workers they had at time T minus one, minus however many they fired, plus how many jobs they demanded adjusted by the hiring to posting rate. Again, this is recursive, and so we're gonna use the time period between 2010 and 2014 to accumulate those series, and from 2015 onwards for estimation. And in the paper, we do some robustness with different starting points, and we do show that by 2015, they tend to converge to roughly the same numbers. This is an example. So you see, this is the estimation that starts at zero for all the jobs. Um, for AI, there is really stuff just start about picking up around 2015, and the big explosion is 2017, 2018. And those are the other two types of jobs. Um, this is in the paper, but if you draw a line at 2015 and show different starting points, by 2015, they kind of look the same, those cumulated series. We also need salaries, that's the last piece of data we need. What's the challenge? We don't just need salaries at the job type level. Financial analyst, a quantitative researcher can be an AI skilled one or an old tech skilled one, and I need to distinguish between those two different workers. And so we get crowdsource level data. This is data that comes from surveys, uh, but how this works is that people through pay scale can actually answer surveys about their current position. And what they get at the end is they get a very detailed report about how their salary is benchmarked against people that do a similar job in the same region, but particularly they have similar skill sets. So what they ask people are, what are the three key skills required in your job? Um, and why that's important, why do people do this? They wanna renegotiate their salary, they wanna know what new uh, tool should I learn? <laughs> I can earn 20,000 more dollars a year if I know Python. And so they're incentivized to tell the truth. And how Payscale then uses this data, they aggregate it and they sell it to the HR of firms so they know how to better benchmark their new job postings. So we get that data. Because it has this skill level information, we're able to actually assess the salary that are paid to workers with the three types of skill sets within a similar sample of firms as those that we have for job postings for. And so now we have all the elements that we need to actually estimate the parameters of our model. How do we do that? With structural estimation. Here, don't think about your classical structural estimation. Just think about it as solving a system of equations. We have four unknowns. We have four equations per form, per period. We use those cross-sectional um, averages to estimate the um, time fixed effect. We use the time series average of those conditions to estimate the firm fixed effects. And then we use nonlinear least squares to iterate across different combinations of parameters until we find the combination of parameters that solves the system. What do we find? Results. We find, and this is what I anticipated to you, we repeat the estimation for different depreciation rates of data. We use the 3%, you'll see in the paper the rationale for that. Um, but that's basically the rate at which you depreciate software and data warehouses and so on in accounting. So we think it's the reasonable one to use in here. But we also show robustness for different depreciation rates. And in our baseline depreciation rate, you see that that difference between alpha and gamma is 5%. Is that big? Is that small? Well, that implies a drop of labor share of income from 18% to 13%. To give you some sense, Similar estimates on the change in the exponent of capital for the Industrial Revolution went from 5 to 20%. These are monthly depreciation rates of data. So if you even think about the 10% one, for which we still have a difference of about 5% in those parameters, that means that in 10 months, my data warehouse is worthless, that I need to reshuffle all my data in 10 months. And if you do empirical analysis, you still use data from 10 months ago to estimate future returns, right? And so we think that that 10% is an extremely conservative metric for this data set. 
Um, now, what pins it down? This is basically shows that the moment of the data that really pins down the difference between alpha and gamma is precisely the covariance between my data stock and the total payments to workers of each type. And so it's really this covariance between the data and the skills that pins down this difference in the productivity. Of course, everything does is structural, so all the structure of the model matters. But we are able to show that really that is the one thing that matters the most in here. Finally, and this is kind of outside of the model, but these are things that we can observe, this is the total amount of AI plus all tech analysts that get hired. It's a clearly increasing trend within this period. And is almost evenly split that growth between the two types of analysts. So we do not see a decrease in demand for workers, neither AI nor all tech. And if you think about it, there is a complementarity in there. Maybe I would not have acquired a massive data set if I didn't have the AI capability to analyze it. But once I have it, my all tech analysts are also going to get an advantage from utilizing that. And so both of those hires go up. As I mentioned, and I promise this is a bit of a side product of the main thing that we're doing, but because we're using this value function um, as our key kind of like optimization, the value function is the value of data, the value of the data stock. So once I have all of these parameters, I can actually do a value function iteration to actually determine what's the value of the data stock of each of these firms in each point in time. So, that's the sense in which we provide a potential methodology to value this intangible asset, which is data, through this labor market approach. And what you see is that clearly the value of the data stock in aggregate of these firms in this period experiences a very, very large growth in a few years. My final point is that the productivity of those uh, fixed effect parameters are also being increasing in this period. So, to conclude, what we show in here is that we infer how much uh, each firm has in terms of data management skills. We use that to infer the data stock of the firms. And then we look at the differences in their data analysis skills to try and pin down the difference in productivity of analyzing large data sets. And we find that there is a very large change which is comparable to as similar estimates for the Industrial Revolution. And we think that this is going to be very important for things we care about like competition, firm size, and so on. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Simona. And next, we're going to have um, Anska Walther from Imperial College to discuss this paper. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, this is a great project. I think, um, you know, usually ambition in terms of going after a really hot question and execution are substitutes in our profession, but this paper goes quite far in both directions. I think it's a very serious attempt to model this properly and also going after a really big topical question. So I think it's, it's great. And as you will see on Simona's website, it already is in the process of getting published, hopefully in a top journal. I'm not one of the referees, so everything I say here is uh, it's purely for consumption. But so, um, is this working? Yeah, it is. So the, I think the big picture question is how is AI going to affect the financial industry? That's why we're all here. And what this paper focuses on is whether AI reduces or increases the labor share of production, uh, which is something that people who are interested in inequality and capitalism and all these things always want to look at. And the main result is it reduces the labor share of production. It increases the quote unquote data share of production or, or capital share more broadly. Uh, so I think there are two big contributions here. One of them is, you know, you find benefits of AI, you know, the, the curve is upward sloping, the TFP is going up with, with AI. Uh, but at the same time, it, there's an unequal, unequal distribution of its benefits, right? It, whether you really make money out of this, whether your standard of living really improves, depending on whether you are an owner of data or a data analyst or data manager, it, you know, the, the coefficients are moving in different directions and that's kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, it's something that I've worked on with Tarun and others as well, this inequality of the benefits. And I think that's 
It's a big question because inequality more broadly is, is a big topic at the moment and, and so this, this is an interesting thing to explore. As a byproduct, like Simona also mentioned, there's a very clever method, new tricks for measuring really opaque intangible investment, which is I think what data acquisition is, right? It's, it's very hard to, to measure it directly and there's a, this is a convincing method for measuring it indirectly, which is new to the literature and, and will probably make an impact in its own right. Now, I want to show you a simplified version of the model just because uh, I want to show you exactly where the estimates come from one more time. Uh, okay, suppose there's a firm who produces using N technologies, and I've changed the notation a little bit here so that everything looks like your micro textbook, okay? So, uh, you know, you want to maximize the sum of your outputs here across N industries or N, N technologies. Uh, you have to pay for capital, the shadow price of capital is rho. We can relabel that to be data later on, but let's just call it K for capital. And you have to pay for N types of specialized labor, which are called LJ and the WJs are the wages. And your output in each of these technologies is basically some TFP times a Cobb-Douglas combination of capital and labor, right? And the way I've written it here, just like the way Simona wrote it, the, the capital is non-rival, right? As soon as you have the capital, you can use it in all your technologies. It turns out that doesn't matter very much, but, but it's a good way to think about data. So Cobb Douglas, we've all done it in our problem sets, right? The optimal expenditure shares, you spend, if the exponent on labor is one minus alpha, you spend one minus alpha share of your output on hiring people. Um, and if the exponent on capital is alpha, you spend the alpha share. And so the, here you have the expenditure on labor in sector J or in technology J, and here you have the expenditure on capital. And the reason there's a sum here is because of the non-rivalry. This is the Samuelson rule, right? This is, uh, you get a marginal benefit in every technology from hiring a marginal unit of capital. So this is just textbook stuff, and now you plug one into the other and you get this nice estimation equation that you can make use of. So your capital stock that you optimally choose is going to be the sum of some coefficient, which I'm gonna call beta j in technology j, which is an increasing function of the alpha, the capital share, right? Um, times your expenditure on labor in that technology, which I'm gonna call xj, right? So this looks like a regression, right? Old tech, right? Linear regression. I can run a linear regression across firms and across time and put fixed effects in and all the other nice stuff that you did and estimate these betas basically. And when I divide two of these betas by each other, so you know technology J and technology K, the, the cost of capital stuff cancels out and I just get a, an estimate of the relative capital share in, in technology J versus K, right? And now I can say, look, J is old tech and K is new tech and, I can, I, and K is capital is data and I can apply this to, to your setting. Right, so the, if it was my paper, I would have actually just put this first, run this regression uh, before going to full-blown structural estimation because this is so transparent. I think this is really pretty. You have a version of this in the paper too and um, it, work, it works very nicely. Okay, so when you try to take this to the data, you say, look, we're going to have two types of labor, old school analysts, let's call them L1, and AI analysts, let's call them L2. And then I'm going to think of capital as being data. And the way we're going to measure data, because we can't see data in, in the data, um, is we're going to infer as some moving average of past hiring of data cleaners. Right? So that's basically what the model is. It's some kind of uh, aggregation of how many people did you put to work cleaning and managing data in the previous periods. Right? So let's call that, for the purpose of my discussion, it's called the L0. These, this is just another type of labor, right? These are people who clean data. Um, okay, and now for each of these categories, you can infer the labor stock from job listings, and you can infer the wages associated with that type of labor from the online survey that you, that you already talked about, right? So then that's how we, then, we have op then we've operationalized this model in a way that can talk about AI data and all the rest of it, right? That, that's, this mapping from this kind of textbook stuff to this, which you can do with standard data sets, is kind of the main clever innovation of the paper in my view. I think that's very nice. Uh, you, 
you don't run the simple regression, you do, you know, more fancy technology, you have your L2. Uh, so you do full structural estimation and you find that the difference in capital shares, uh, I think this is actually the wrong way around. In any way, the labor share goes down by 5%, five percentage points when you move to AI, right? So um, new tech places more weight on, um, on data and a, by association on the people that are cleaning the data and generating it uh, than it does on analysts, right? So analysts become less important when you've switched from old tech to new tech. Data stocks and data production becomes more important and receives a larger share of, of, of social surplus. And I think these has, this is a very interesting distributional implication, both inside and outside the financial industry, right? I, I think it makes perfect sense. I think, you know, even in our profession, you see, I think the reason that most empirical researchers get paid and have good careers is not because they can type reg YX, right? It's because they can, um, because they can ask good questions and structure the structured data in a way that allows them to answer that question. And that's what's kind of happening here, right? You're shifting the surplus to the people generating usable data sets. Uh, I found the industrial revolution analogy confusing, to be honest. I, I think maybe you don't need that. I think the, you know, what I've just said is a first order contribution. To say it's like the industrial revolution, I'm not sure. You know, the labor share in knowledge production, as you characterize it, is very different from labor share in output or in, in overall social, social productivity, uh, which is what people focused on in the Industrial Revolution, right? The, you're deliberately taking out also all jobs that are not associated with AI or old school analysis or data cleaning, right? So it's perfectly possible that other jobs in finance, like structuring, sales, executive jobs, uh, which convert that knowledge into ultimate profit for the financial industry, obtain greater labor shares once we move to AI, right? That's not something you've measured and that's something that could very well be the case. It could be that we talked about this a little bit yesterday in the panel discussion, right? When the robots come, maybe you need skilled people who can convert robot stuff into actual human products more than ever, right? And um, I wouldn't rule that out. I think I think we don't know, and that's fine. Um, I'm not sure if I would if I would think about this as being about data, the K, whether it's about data or about data cleaning labor, right? Because they are kind of the same thing in your analysis. The the capital stock, the labor hiring of old school people, and the labor hiring of AI people are all just estimated moving averages of past job postings. Once you look at the maths, basically. So why would you interpret one of them as a capital stock and the other one as a, as a labor hiring? I'm not sure. You know, data comes from lots of places. Uh, you know, the raw data itself is produced in some way, maybe using some physical infrastructure, etc. So I think the, the model of how data is accumulated is maybe a bit simple. But what you can definitely say something about is the importance of the data that, of the labor that generates structured data. And I think that's in its own right very very insightful. So I would focus on these data cleaners. You know, they're getting more of the surplus now, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I don't know, data cleaners are not just sort of mechanical people, right? They're, they're, they're also people who, uh, who ask the right questions. So maybe I'm conflating those two things together. Um, something you mentioned in the paper and which I think is important is that we can't separ separately identify the general equilibrium effects, right? So if everybody's pushing into AI, especially in finance, the marginal value or sort of like the price of generating this knowledge, which I've written as PY here, might decline, right? Because basically if, if you have a great signal but everybody else has the same signal and you're trading, that signal becomes worthless, right? So then, um, and similar things might be going on even at the industry level, right? At some point you might run into diminishing returns. And what you can identify is basically the price times TFP, which you just call TFP, and that's the, that's the catch-all term, right? And I think to, to say something about, you know, where are we actually going once the revolution is finished, we, we would have to talk about that. Uh, quickly talk about welfare. I don't have much time left, but when you work out what happens in the revolution, right? So what, what you were saying, I think, and what I think is reasonable is that 
beyond your data set, there's probably going to be more sharp growth in A2, right? The, the TFP of the AI technology and the dominance of that technology, uh, which means people will ac accumulate more data, which also makes the old school labor more valuable. So W1, the old school wage, will also go up, right? So if you think about the welfare of a worker, it, they're Pareto better off, right? You can work old school for a higher wage, you can work new school for an even higher wage, or you can become a data cleaner, which also becomes very well rewarded. And so, you know, your opportunity set has become wider and you're better off, right? So it's not like winners and losers. Uh, that's important to emphasize. Uh, and it's different from, for example, Asimoglu and Restrepo, where uh, you have other functional forms in Cobb Douglas which allow replacement. Some people literally get pushed out by the technology and become worse off if they can't switch to a different task. And so that's, um, that's I think, something that you could discuss, maybe not in this paper, but in the next one. Uh, I've also got some slides that I definitely don't have time to go through. If I make data capital rivalrous, just like in the textbook, uh, I get the exact same estimation equation, so that's observationally equivalent. If I make, uh, if I let firms use a single technology that just combines old and new school labor, I get an estimation equation that again looks very similar in terms of its relationships to labor shares. So I'm not sure whether you can say that you've got evidence for the particular functional form that you assume. Of course, you have to start somewhere. Uh, it would be unfair to say that you have to explore all possible models. But you know, for example, the question of what, are we really running two separate technologies or are we running one technology that you just both old and new school analysis? I think that's kind of an interesting question in itself that you could try to disentangle further with this agenda. Okay, in, in conclusion, there's been a lot of progress. There's really tight implications for how knowledge is produced and there is potential for more flexible models that talk about things like replacement, single versus multiple technologies, etc. But I, I really enjoyed this and um, I wish you the best of luck with the people who are your referees. And um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, thank you so much for the discussion. Um, yeah, great points. I think some of the questions that they did ask is to flesh out a little bit more the, the contribution and the importance. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to use some of your points on inequality and on the different ways in which you positioned our contribution is going to be very helpful in the revision. So you see you're going to have an impact on that as well. Um, just a couple comments. I agree that running the regression would be a much simpler way. In this particular case, we cannot do it before we estimate the data stock, which is why we do it after the structural estimation. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do before because we have that fourth condition and some of the stuff that we need for that regression we don't have before we run the structural approach. And so we do do it afterwards because I think it's a very valuable kind of point. And, and I agree, the comparison with the Industrial Revolution is within a small set, is within an industry. There is a lot happening and some of the Industrial Revolution estimates, they look at the whole economy. And so that's a, it's a very, very fair point. Uh, the one thing I want to say though, we do focus on the knowledge production, right? So it's true that data requires label to have the data stock and we're not talking about that side in terms of knowledge production. But it's, it's a similar to when you think about capital, that process of capital accumulation that also requires labor of whatever, the investment managers to which I, I have invested my capital and the capital is generating a return. So in that sense, it's, it's similar. There is labor involved in the generation of some of the inputs and labor involved in capital accumulation. There's labor involved in data accumulation and so but I do agree that it would be interesting to kind of talk about that side a bit more because it's an interesting component of that flow that we're describing. Okay, but thank you so much. So I think the presentation and discussion are so impressive that I don't want to inter uh, in inter interrupt it. Yeah, so we have only one minute for questions. Uh, so first, yeah. The lady first, and then we're gonna have... <laughs> Thinking about the production function, there is a lot of related questions that immediately sort of spring to mind. What about spillover effects? And data is not something that is actually kind of specific to that company quite often. There is a lot of, you know, other uses, you know, the same data sets can be in other places. Companies also have obviously different, you know, uh, ability to generate new data if you think about, you know, Google and things. So um, one also starts thinking about the value of data intermediation as a kind of a new sector of the economy. So 
Um, I know that you have a lot of work on a lot of those, you know, related questions. So, so any, uh, um, you know, general kind of guess, you know, to which extent all these issues are going to be integral for the estimates that yeah. you presented? So I think one of the key reasons why focusing on investment management is that I think some of those things kind of are less relevant. In some other industries, it doesn't matter so much if we all have the same data, but you're not going to see Renaissance selling data to Two Sigma. Uh, and so that transfer, at least across firms, is going to be less important in that sense in this particular industry. But I agree that if we want to expand this to the general economy, thinking about that intermediary sector and data as an asset is extremely important. Uh, this is another one of those settings in which the main use that Two Sigma is going to make of the data is for the generation of the trading signals. Whereas you can think in other industries, in other firms, data can be used for many, many other uses and then we need to internalize all of that in, in the estimation. So I think that in this particular exercise, I, I of course, these are estimates, so you know we hope that there is going to be people coming after us that, that can do this most, more precisely. But I'm not too concerned that in this particular setting, those effects are going to be of primary importance. But if we want to expand this methodology to other sectors or to think about the economy more in general, those are first order points. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, very interesting. So I just wanted to make a comment that you know, we've kind of seen this movie before, or at least somebody who's as old as I has been in the industry since the 80s. I and mean, this is basically what happened in the 80s and 90s with the you know, ubiquitousness of, of, of computing power being, being introduced and the introduction of you know, quantitative methods like, you know, you couldn't. It was very difficult to do old school regressions before you had, you know, uh, technology in the way that you know evolved over these decades. So in terms of the parallel to the industrial revolution and so on, I mean there is a shorter term parallel that can be done that I think is actually quite interesting to think yeah. about. So I think that that's a, that's a great point and we did put a bit of thought in that. So the reason why we went for this um, industrial revolution parallel rather than these other things is that we think you can have similar effects coming through different channels. So we could have found that those parameters are exactly ident identical, so it doesn't change the mix of inputs in the production, but those TFP parameters, those scaling parameters, get this massive change. And that is what happens on a lot of these technologies. I just, a new thing comes in, as I learn to use it better, it really scales up uh, the production of knowledge. But in some cases, it might be just a scaling factor, and in other cases, it might actually change that mix of inputs. Uh, in determining the productivity. And to us, it's important to determine whether it's coming from one place or the other because it has very different implications for inequality and all these different things. And so we have the feeling that this particular technology, because it acts on the productivity of analyzing that input, it might actually be slightly different in terms of changing that mix. It's not that the outcome on the total production could not be the same with other technologies, but we did feel that this particular one had a, a better chance at being the one that actually changes the mix of inputs. And, and that has different consequences. So that's why we think about it in these well, terms. And I think I can try to say that, you know, that's what happened. They're changing the mix of inputs. Mm -hmm. You know, the birth of quantitative investment and everything. No, for sure. Something that I, you know, have a similar qualitative effects in this picture of the industry. There's definitely worth thinking about. I have some other work that thinks about fixed, uh, fixed rules approach to quantitative analysis relative to human based approach. Um, I think of it slightly differently, but uh, it also had a massive effect. So it's, it's worth considering.